Hey, would you turn in your Bibles this morning to Mark chapter 5? And uh, we're going to start with verse 21. We're continuing on having a heart for holiness and how this works. And I, I, I'm going to share something this morning that is really fresh revelation for me. Um, in my pursuit during this Rosh Hashanah part of the year, um, I'm pursuing holiness. How many of you know that during the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, there is 10 days of repentance? And that really began back, uh, back, in, back in Thursday, back last Thursday. And one person raised their hand, God bless you, sir, that you knew that. Oh, there's two. Do I get a third? Okay, motion carried. All right, so awesome. This time in Jewish, uh, and when, you, when you look at the feast, this time in the Jewish calendar is a time of repentance. And so as I'm, as I'm thinking about repentance in my life, and I'm studying the scriptures and growing in my revelation of what holiness means, I stumbled upon, and I should have, years ago, I should have got this when I first read it, but how many of you know you can open your Bible and, and, and just go, wow, I never, I never seen that before, okay? And what I want to talk to you today is about how holiness works with God and how it comes from a touch. Now, I never thought that holiness came from a touch. But it comes from a touch. And I'm going to talk to you about who to touch. Don't touch me. <laughs> right? No touching, no touchy. I'm not talking about touching your neighbor, although a hug would be nice. I'm talking about the contact that you make with Christ as you cling to Christ. And as you cling and touching the Messiah, who is holy, you become holy. And man, I'm telling you what, it, get, it just Oh, this week, I've been like, wow, God, if I could just cling to the Savior. Let me give you an ex example of what this is like. Uh, recently, uh, as you know, our youth pastor and his wife just had a, a new baby, and uh, so we, we brought some food over, right? And uh, Harrison and I, they're, they're first, uh, firstborn, we've got a relationship, Okay. <laughs> And I, how, how many of you know, I've taught Harrison a lot of things that are wrong. I just, I've taught him some things. And one of the things, uh, I got a little Pentecostal joke that I do with him, and somebody's going to get offended, but get offended. But one of those things is, is I've taught him to hit me with the, the anointing, right? And so he'll come up and, and go, bam, and I'll get blessed. And I'll go, oh, yeah, you know. We've got a new thing, and we, we just put it into practice the last time I went to see Harrison. How many of you, when you were a little kid or when you had little kids, you would tell him, get on my foot, cling to my leg, and go for a ride. Come on. And I mean, I want to tell you, that's the best experience. Cedar Point has nothing on that when you're little. And, and, and what, I, what I was doing with Harrison, it just makes, me feel, <laughs> just makes me feel so full of love that he would trust me. He would get on my leg, but he would get on my leg backwards. So his feet were going the other direction. And, 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 and Daddy, Pastor Tyler, had to come on and go, no, 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 the, your legs go this way, and you, your arms go this way. And he clinged on to my leg, and I started carrying him around the house, you know. And he's like, yeah, yeah. Some of you, you want to go for that ride. I'm not that in shape. I can't. As much as I'd love to do that for you this morning, I can't. But it works for Harrison. It works for Harrison. And you know, when I got ready to leave... He was almost in tears because one of the things I love about this little boy is what he teaches me about love. His parents have taught him. His parents have taught him, go give him some love. Go give him some love. You'll see this out, out of Harrison. Go give him some love. And, and to Harrison, you know, he was just giving me love and he was enjoying clinging to me. And as he clinged to me, I was enjoying his love. Right? And I was taking him places. And as we began to leave, I taught him something wrong again. You know, but, you know, I, I, I always tell Harrison, you want some of this, right? Like the fist. And I'm like, I got a backup right here. If that one ain't working, step on up to the microphone. You get some of that. And now he says, you want some of this? You know, and I love it. I love it. I love it. As I was leaving, I could look in the distance out of my rearview mirror. And there was Harrison on, on Tyler and Jocelyn's porch going. And I thank God that, you know, Tyler and Jocelyn are not legalistic. And don't, don't freak out over every little thing I do. 
Some of it needs to be reined in, okay? But, but something transfers from me to him. And when you, when you come in to touch, when you cling to God, even in your unrighteousness, and see, that's the thing. When we're feeling the most shame and guilt and unholiness, the last thing we want to do is come close and cling. But it's the, it's the coming and running to God, not away from God, that brings you back to holiness. And, and God, all God wants you to do is to come to him like a child. And to cling to his son, Jesus Christ, and go for a ride. Now, let that settle in your spirit as I begin to teach these verses this morning. Because you're going to get a couple of stories. One, I'll start today. The second will be next week. But there's a woman with an issue of blood. We call this in seminary the Markin Sandwich. All right? This whole chapter has two bookends. One is a woman who has an issue of blood who has no business touching Jesus. No business. Who at the end of touching Jesus is called by Jesus, daughter. You and I have heard that the only miracle that happened was the healing of the drying up of that issue of blood. That wasn't the only miracle. Jesus had called no one else before her daughter. To call her daughter meant that she was in the family meant that she was not just healed, she was forgiven. I wonder who I'm talking to this morning. This gets me so excited. And all it took was a touch. All it took was a clinging. The thing that we've got to get in this story is that at the end of the story is another bookend. And it's another young lady. And this time, Jesus is touching her. The first one, Jesus is being touched. Come on. The second one, Jesus is touching her, right? But she's dead. We're not supposed to touch dead people. The law in Leviticus and in Numbers says that if anybody has an issue of blood or if they have a wound and it's bleeding, you will be made unclean for seven days. You have to go through ceremonial rituals to come back out around people again. People that are bleeding are not supposed to touch people that aren't. It's unclean. Is Jesus breaking the law here? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I'm going to help you here in a minute. See, nothing could be more lawful and more of God's grace than this moment. At the end of the story, here's a dead person. This is the little girl. Jesus sees her lying there and calls it a nap. From heaven's point of view, death is just for the body a nap. <laughs> He says, guys, calm yourselves down. Simba down. She's just sleeping. The resurrection and the life is here, right now. And so what does he do? He touches her. He takes her by the hand. And that's where we're going to land the plane next week, how Jesus touches this little girl. And what he does when he touches her, not only raises her from the dead but also gets her holy too. Now you should have been listening because last week we talked about holiness and how the Hebrew word for holiness is kadash. Kadash means separate, stay away. It means means to become sacred. It means to be separate from the world. Do not touch, do not touch, do not touch. It means to be fully consecrated unto the Lord. And yet we see the holiest person that ever lived, Jesus, in fact, there is none other that are holy, being touched and touching. And in the process, people are not just healed, they're forgiven of sin. Oh, my Lanta, you ain't ready for this one. I'm telling you now, you better get this today. This is not only going to set you free, it's going to empower you to live holy. Let's talk about this here. Verse 21, Jesus got out of the boat again, went back to the other side of the lake. This is the Sea of Galilee, where a large crowd had gathered around him on shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus. Now, Jairus means the light. We'll get to that next week, okay? The church, by the way, is the light, right? But Jairus has a daughter, and the daughter is in need of a touch. 
And can I tell you something today? The daughter represents the church too, or the bride of Christ. She can't have babies because she's dead. The other woman that's in this story can't have babies because she has an issue of blood. Revival tarries for the church of God today because the mature part of the church has so many issues, it can't have babies spiritually. Anybody tracking? I thought this was a Pentecostal church. And the other part of the church today, the reason why revival tarries, is because we have so many young converts who have never been discipled and be mature enough to raise up children themselves. One part of the church is dead and dying. The other part of the church has too many issues. But God shows up and says, woman, you're my daughter. And then later says, little girl, rise. Come on, hallelujah. The resurrection is in Jesus and the fruitfulness is in Jesus. This guy, Jarius, when he arrived, he saw Jesus fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come, lay your hands on her. <clears throat> Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him and the people followed, followed, crowding around him. Watch this, crowding. There were lots of people touching Jesus. There are all kinds of people touching Jesus today. There are all kinds of Americans touching Jesus today. Not everybody's getting healed. Not everybody's getting forgiven. Not everybody's becoming a believer. There's a whole entire country of millions of people saying they touch Jesus. They're in connection or contact with Jesus. They're reaching out to Jesus, but they've not been changed. I want to tell you it takes more than a touch. In fact, in this case, Jesus says to her, who touched me? Then said, your faith has made you whole. There's lots of people touching, but not, so, not a lot of people having faith in their touch. Oh, man. Some people believe if they touch a certain church leader, oh, come on. You got to touch Jesus and you got to touch in faith. There's all kinds of people crowding around him. They're not getting healed. They're not getting changed. They're not being called son or daughter. What is the difference? Your faith has made you whole. Hallelujah. Verse 25, a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years. Now notice this, notice this. The little girl that died, understand this, she was 12. You're not with me. The little girl he's on the way to, raised from the dead, she 12. This woman with an issue of blood, 12 years. Wow. I want to show you these stories, <laughs> these stories go together. God is telling us something here. Twelve in the Bible is the number of government or God's people representative of God's power in the earth. Twelve tribes, come on, 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe, right? What do they do? They go out and evangelize, twelve disciples. This represents God's people in the earth. And yet, one, for twelve years, cannot do what God had called her to do as the bride of Christ because of her issues. And her issues had tissues. Lots of issues. So much so that the Bible says she had spent all the money she had going to various physicians and none of them could do anything for her. Now this is extra biblical. This is part of archaeology. So I give you that caveat. But during this time, one of the medicines that they used to try to heal a person who had an issue of blood in a feminine area was actually a diuretic. I want you to think for a second how much energy this woman really had. For 12 years, she's bleeding out. For 12 years. She knows she's unclean. She knows the law says she's not even allowed to go into the city, let alone touch anybody. And along the way, she spent all her money on medicines that all those medicines have done is make her even worse and sick. I want to tell you today, there's too much preaching that doesn't change lives. There's too much preaching that's so watered down, and I don't want to go there. But it's so watered down, it's not handling the issue. Truth from God's word will handle the issue. Not this watered down stuff that comes from man, that psycho babble that's telling people you're okay, I'm okay, just embrace your okayness. Know this. You and I have issues, and the answer is Jesus. And you and I must have the faith to go and cling to him. 
And if you're not willing to cling, you're not willing to be clean. You say, well, pastor, can I sin all I want and still cling? Let me tell you something. As soon as you start clinging, you'll, you, you won't want to sin. I'm telling you something. When you have an encounter with him, and when you're close enough in your cling, right now I'm thinking of the cling-ons. But be a cling-on. Cling to him so close that the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glorious, what, come on, grace. Woo! I'm telling you what, prayer will keep you out of sin or sin will keep you out of prayer. Reading the word will keep you out of sin or sin will keep you out of reading the word. If after you sin, you overcome the shame, the guilt, the pride, and the self-righteousness that you thought you had, and you say to yourself, I must cling to him one more time. The more you do that, the more you'll teach all of hell, all the demons of hell, and the more you'll teach your own flesh that you will come to him, not run from him. Amen. In the name of Jesus, your life will change. I'm going to tell you something. I spend time with people in the south. And I drive back up north, and I start talking southern. I don't tell myself talk southern. I just get around people who have a slang. And then when, that, when I get around people who have a slang, I start to have a slang. When you get close enough to Jesus, you're going to change. The, the, the issue is proximity. The issue is you coming to him. Can I get a strong amen this morning? Yeah. Amen. So I want you to see what, what happens here, okay? She suffered a great deal from many doctors, so she suffered from all these people. And by the way, at that time, doctors were also priests. <laughs> Most of them were priests. Because you had to go and show yourself to the priest when you were ill. And you know, what the, you know what the issue is? The priest couldn't touch you either. Unless you were the high priest, but we got one, don't we? <laughs> all right, watch this. In fact, it even gotten worse. So she had heard about Jesus. <laughs> So she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. She thought right, and she heard right. Immediately the bleeding had stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that the healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around, and that's where the, that's where the sermon's going to end this morning. He turned around. I want, I, want, I want to show you something very, very quickly. Throughout the Old Testament, over and over again, God is always turning his back. If you're going to see God, if you're going to have contact with God, you get to see his back. Because no man can see his face and live. Because of the unrighteousness and the unholiness in your life will kill you in the presence of that much holiness. Can I help you understand that it took Jesus to come to the earth in bodily form so that God could actually be with us bodily. Otherwise, it'd kill everybody. You, you and I don't see the gravity of our sin. We're, we're so comfortable with it, we don't understand how much it's a payment for death in death. But in God's eyes, he can't look at it. But in sending his son, Jesus Christ, and sending him here bodily, and then dying and taking your place substitutionally on the cross, you and I now can come close. You and I can come through the veil. You and I can have contact with the Father. And the big deal about that is, now you can look God in the face. I want to tell you something. Jesus turned around. Can you see the deity here? The deity here is saying, no longer are you going to see my back in your sin. You're going to see my face. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full. And the things of earth grow dim. Do you see how this works? Strangely dim. Yeah, he turns around. He says, who touched my robe? Who touched me? His disciples say, look at the crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched you? Now we get to pray. You can tell, man, I'm on, I'm, man, I'm telling you what, I'm on Jesus steroids this morning. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, God, for the revelation of what it means that we can come close. We thank you that, God, that we come close because of Jesus. And when we do, even in our sinful state, God, we are made whole. We are made righteous. And ultimately, God, we are made holy. We give you the praise. We give you the thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's talk about some dumb laws. You want to hear some dumb laws? How about some dumb Ohio laws? 
Would you like to hear a few? Oh, you don't want to hear it, huh? Oh, okay, okay. In Columbus, you cannot legally sell cornflakes on Sunday. It's on the law books. Now, you can eat grape nuts, but you can't eat cornflakes. And you don't care. Okay. Look at this one here. You cannot, in the state of Ohio, watch this, you cannot get a fish drunk. I don't think we need to worry about the fish drinking, do we? Right? Actually, it has to do with something about the runoff from chemicals used, right? But if, but if a fish gets intoxicated, you, you're, that's a misdemeanor. Okay, here's the next one. In Perrysburg, Perrysburg, you don't know anything about that, do you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, the Perrysburg. Where are you from? I'm from Perrysburg. I don't pastor there, so I can make fun of it all I want. In Perrysburg, you cannot breed whales. They don't. <laughs> I should start running this by my wife before service. <laughs> Ordinance 618.22. <laughs> Residents are prohibited from possessing a whale and breeding them, or dolphins, or porpoises, as well as vampire bats, armadillos, and many more. <laughs> Only in Parisburg. Now, I live in Finley, so I can do all the whales I want. <laughs> I can put, I have a big old whale here, a whale there. Everywhere, here, here's a, here, there, a whale. You cannot go mouse hunting in Cleveland. If you, if, if you go hunting and you hunt mice, you need, that's part of your hunting license. You have to pay an extra stamp and tell them, I'm going to hunt mice. Now, this, this, this takes a cake. There's a true story here. Um, can somebody help me out? Is it Kosh, Kosh, that place. You can't make your mama jokes in shopping centers in that place. I would advise you to not make your mama jokes anywhere. Like anywhere. In Finley. Don't do it. Did I tell you once? I got a sidebar here. My son at McDonald's one time, little guy, about seven or eight years old, was playing in the balls. A bunch of kids come running out. A couple of those kids had some mad mamas. They come out running out too. They were mad. This wasn't just like mad Karens. They were mad mamas. My son had punched one of those boys straight in the nose. Yeah. So the mamas come out. They start telling their story, everything else. My wife's like, she's livid. We don't hit people. You know, son, we don't hit people. You don't do that. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Let's hear the rest of the story. What's your side of the story? Isaac says, Mom, they were calling you fat. And Sarah goes, you hit those boys all you want. You hit them anytime you want. Go back, go back and hit them. She did. She did. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And yes, we were pastoring. We were pastoring. And she was serious. <laughs> okay, last one. Um... <laughs> Yeah, she was serious, man. And Isaac's like, well, well, well they left, you know. Said, All right, so um, in Marion, Ohio, uh, in Marion is, I don't know, I haven't been here long, five years for me, okay. But in Marion, Ohio, you cannot eat a donut while walking backwards. If you're, <laughs> if you're having, a, well, not that you'd want to, but if you're eating a jelly donut or a donut, you have to walk forwards. You cannot walk. It's a misdemeanor. If you're caught on the street and in the same town, in the same town, you'll get a ticket for running out of gas because, because, because you're, you're impeding traffic or, or, or whatever. Just dumb loss. Just dumb loss. It's crazy. I'll eat a donut whether I'm going this way or that way or I'm coming out that way. I like donuts. I, I just do it. I've seen some of you eating donuts and walking backwards in there this morning. The Old Testament had some loss. And these laws were before we had a lot of science about what was biologically going on. And how many of you know God got way ahead of it and made sure that when it came to mold, like you, you actually had to have a priest come and you scrubbed your house if there was any sign of mold and you had to leave your house. They didn't know why, but God knew. And, and so they had to deal with mold a certain way. 
There were food and dietary laws. There were other laws. And if you think about some of these laws, we're just beginning to see today that some of those would give us a better heart and circulatory system. Come on. God knew. But there were also laws about touching the dead because we didn't know back then that there were some biological things going on that could make you sick, right? And uh, so if somebody died, the people in, in a building, the people that went in and got the building had to work together to get the person out a certain way, and then they were, you couldn't approach them for seven days. They had to go through a ritual cleansing process, okay? They even have in Israel, and we've seen some of them when we've been there, mikvahs that before you came, became uh, a part of a church service, you had to be baptized every single service. You would ritually cleanse. And people thought, well, that's just so that I can go in and, and, and be pure. But the reality was is we all carry germs. And so they were cleansing themselves all the time. And if you had some type of a wound or some type of an issue of blood that carried biological issues as well, God knew that. So he had law. They're not dumb laws. Until they impede somebody from being healed and being forgiven, then it gets dumb. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. In the same Old Testament that has those laws is the same Old Testament that says this, and this is going to blow your spiritual minds. In the same Old Testament, it says anyone that touches the altar of God, anyone that touches the items on the altar of God, anyone that touches the showbread or touches the sin sacrifice will immediately be made holy. And then... I love you, sister. You got it already. Some people are just, they got it. And, you know, I'm, I'm learning that Cindy Vega has it, okay? So then Jesus comes down, who the Bible says is in him is the fullness of God bodily, who becomes the ultimate sacrifice of God, who says he is the bread of life. Come on. In, in Ezekiel... God tells the priests when they go back to reinstituting worship to wear certain robes over the robes that they conduct worship in the temple with just in case someone might just touch your robe and be holy. They knew in the Old Testament that there was something worn by a person who had been in the presence of God, who had touched God. Are you with me? And in their touching of God, not in themselves, but in the impartation of touching God, they themselves become holy. Now this ought to blow your mind because when you get to the New Testament, the Bible says, for sick people, put your hands on them. You never read that before like this what am i doing as a jew putting my hand on a sick person unless i myself have been made holy the same new testament says let's worship him by lifting up holy hands Hallelujah. This is not about you, and it's not about me. I've been in contact with him, and in my clinging to him, and the Lord saying, Roop, Roop, and him lifting me closer and closer to the Father, I am changed. And something about my life then becomes consecrated. And then when I pray for you, it is not my hand, but it is the contact that I've had with the hand of Jesus that transforms you. Well, I didn't go to a Pentecostal church and everybody's putting their hands on me to pray. Don't you know it's a no-touchy world? Not until you're made holy. When you're made holy and when you've been in contact with him, and you've been with God, and people come close to you. What comes off of you, just like Peter's shadow, just like Paul's handkerchief? I think Paul was a sweater, <laughs> not just T.D. Jakes and Glenn. 
he'd do this and he'd send it out and people get healed. It wasn't the sweat, it wasn't the handkerchief. It was the contact of the person. I want to give you these scriptures so you can write them down. Exodus 29, 37. The altar shall be made most holy. Whatever touches the altar shall become holy. Did you get that? If I could just make it to the altar. If I could just make it to the altar. My life would change. Watch this. Watch this. Exodus 30, verse 29. It says, you shall consecrate them. These are the items of the tabernacle, the altar of incense, the lampstand, the utensils, the showbread, the sin offering. You will consecrate, make them holy, kadash, make them holy, that they may be most holy, and whatever touches them will be holy. See, holiness is infectious. You thought sin was infectious, so is holiness. <laughs> In Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 19, and when they go out of the outer court to the people, the priests, they shall put off the garments in which they have been ministering and lay them in holy chambers. And they shall put on other garments lest they transmit holiness to the people through their garments. And Jesus comes walking in a crowd. Jesus comes walking in a crowd. And I'm not a Jewish guy, so I'm a German dude. All I know how to do is eat sausage. But, okay, here it is, yeah. So Jesus comes walking in a crowd. And he's got his prayer closet. He's got his talith. This talith means covering. It also can mean prayer tent. When you hear this in the Bible, get in your prayer tent. Get alone in your prayer closet. This would be your prayer. Come on, church. Closet. Okay? It would be covered with 613 of these knots. These are mitzvahs. Say it with me. Mitzvah. Don't spit on your neighbor. Mitzvahs. Laws, rules. Imagine, if you will, if you began to live your life and drove this way. You know the rules of the road. But imagine if you wore something with you every time you drove that reminded you to say so many seconds behind the car in front of you to stop completely at a stop sign and not have a rolling stop. Imagine if you actually used your turning signal, which is a novel concept. Imagine if you had something to remind you every day of all of the rules of the road. This is what the Talith did. It reminded a Jewish man by the, by the age of 12 and beyond. He is a bar son, mitzvah, son of the law. He is married to the law before he's married to a, a female. And so the Jewish man would wear this and he would count these tassels. And then we read in the Old Testament where it says the Messiah will come with healing in his wings or in his rays or in his tassels. <sighs> this, this woman with an issue of blood had no business touching Jesus because if Jesus had any sin in him, it would have defiled Jesus and it would have continued to defile her and defiled everybody that was there. Jesus wore this not because he needed to be reminded of it. He wore it because someone else needed to touch it. And the Bible says that she said to herself, oh, if I could just touch his robe. Now here's what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees lengthened this, this talith, lengthened it. Because they thought if it's longer, then maybe it'll show people more righteous. How many of you know the law doesn't make you righteous? One amen? How's that working for you? I'm not telling you to become lawless. But I'm telling you this, the function of the law is not to make you righteous. The function of the law is to point out your unrighteousness. The wearer of this robe, this talith, wasn't wearing it because he needed to be reminded. He was wearing it to show that he had fulfilled it all. That all of it was fulfilled in him. And that he as a priest was holy. And he was right with God and had been with God the Father. And he was perfect in every way. So for this woman in her unclean state to reach out and grab a hold of this, she was grabbing a hold of his righteousness. Can I tell you to put down your self-righteousness today? Can I tell you that one of the major issues with the church today is its own self-righteousness? 
What keeps you from God the most is your own prideful thinking that you're doing pretty good. Can I tell you that in the Old Testament, and I'm not trying to be coarse, but in the Old Testament in Isaiah, it says, from the Lord through Isaiah, your righteousness is as filthy rags. I'm not trying to be coarse, but that scripture, that rag is a menstrual cloth. You say, I didn't know that. It's true. In other words, God is saying, what you think about you that is so good and so perfect to me is as dirty and as unclean as that menstrual cloth. This woman had an issue of blood. She was very familiar with that type of cloth. And yet she reached out to touch another cloth. And when she did, God turned around. <laughs> Some scholars try to say she stole it from him. You can't steal it from someone that's already willing to give. He's willing to give. The church today is full of people that are trying to clean their, clean their issue up before they come and touch him. And God says, just come and grab a hold of me. Come, come, and, come and cling to me, says the Lord. And my righteousness will become your righteousness. You'll become more and more and more like me just by your contact with me. And that's how holiness works. It's not your works. It's not what you've been trying to do for years. Some of you have habits that have not been broken for years. And I'm here to tell you, if you'll just cling, if you'll just cling, if you'll just touch God and allow God to touch you, you'll be made whole. And you'll be made holy. Can I tell you that in the atonement is not just the forgiveness of sins, but also the healing of your body? Or did Isaiah not say in Isaiah 53, 5, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon his back, and by his stripes we are healed. You get both. You don't just get the cookie, and you get the milk too. With God, it's milk and cookies. God wants you to have both. And the only requirement was to reach out and touch and grab. How do we do that today? I'm going to leave you with this idea. This is going to help you. Please, please listen to me, church. This all started out with a simple phrase. She had heard. Say it with me. She had heard. Number one. Number two. She had heard about Jesus. What caused her to have the strength to push through the crowd, to overcome what the law said about her, to push through people even know that she had no business doing it? She had heard, and she had heard about Jesus. What did she hear? She didn't hear Jesus speak. Listen, listen, listen. Many people had heard and was healed. She had never heard him speak. When she was healed, she was healed with a touch and nothing was said from Jesus until after she was healed. She had heard. What have you heard? Have you heard right? There's so much preaching that isn't right. Legalism, tradition, let me add this to the cross. Let me add that to the cross. Oh, you're not. No, listen, until you become a church member, listen, Fifi, you got to jump through this big old flame and hoop. When you get your life perfect, then you know what? Then you can belong. What have you heard? Well, when you get your life completely cleaned up, when you get all this right, and you get that right. When you live in this part of Finley, then you can come. Then you can come close. When you take pastor out for at least three lunches. Now you're getting close there, but. Now, there's another side to that. There's another side to that that says, sin all you want. Go sin all you want, because there's plenty of grace. Should we sin that grace may abound? 
God forbid. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying if you've really been touched by grace, you won't want to. You won't want to. But not everybody's heard that, have they? Everybody's heard everything else but the truth. Let me go a little bit farther. Not only does the Bible tell us in Romans chapter 10, verse, I believe, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What word of God? She didn't hear Jesus speak, so where did she get it from? She got it from other people. Where do you think you got it from? Unless the clouds roll back on you, Doc, you heard it from somebody, and somebody told you right. You know how I can tell? Your cute little rear end is sitting here this morning. Yeah, you heard. I hope you heard right. She had heard about Jesus. Not about the pastor, not about how great the church is, not about the worship team, not about how many people go there. Oh, would you, we just had us an outreach and 5,000 people came to our outreach and ate all our chicken. <laughs> Bunch of chicken, chicken eaters. <laughs> is that all you heard? I don't care if they're passing out a million dollars. Did you hear about Jesus? I'm sick of it. I've been in the ministry my whole life. Since I was a little kid, man, I've been doing this. I only want to talk about Him. The only thing that's going to transform your life and the only thing that's going to transform my life is Jesus. Yes, I have heard, but I want to hear about Jesus. Has somebody touched Jesus? Well, 5,000 showed up great, but did the one show up? Jesus. Oh, my. She had heard, and she had heard about Jesus. You say, Pastor, I, I don't know if healing's for me. Have you heard? Have you heard? I don't know what you heard, but he's healing everybody. <laughs> In the scriptures, it says he healed everybody. Everybody. I don't know what you heard, but I heard that. I heard that. Have you heard about Jesus? That's all it took. I haven't heard, seen the clouds roll back either. I know some of you think in order to pastor or to be a minister, there must be some type of supernatural moment. I told you before, I'd pee my pants if the clouds rolled back. <laughs> I never had that experience. All I can do is tell you that I heard. And I didn't hear his voice, but someday I will. Someday I will. And my Bible says, the thing I'll hear is well done. Good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. And then he's going to call me by a name that is really my name. And it ain't Glenn. And by the way, you watch TV, Glenn's always the goober. I'm ready for my new name. It's Rocky Stud something. But it's, it, I know it's something in that category. And my wife shakes her head. Where is your faith, dear? We're only hearing from other people that have come in contact with him. Do you realize how important your testimony and what you share is? The woman with the issue of blood works with you, lives on your block, is your neighbor. I walked up to my neighbor this morning. He's out trimming his... Uh, his windows yesterday lord told me to do something and i disobeyed and you're like that's it pastor you creepo because i'm the only one that ever disobeys in this church what are you laughing for <laughs> i'm kidding you man this morning i'm walking back from we won't say where you know where i go and I'm coming back. I got me a little morning drink and some candy. And I walk by him, and there he is. The Lord says, go up to him and tell him what you're supposed to tell him. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> and he's like, what? <laughs> and he said, for you, he said, 
what? I said, can I talk with you? He's like, what? I said, you know, our church has got some ladders that have hit those other windows. And if you want, to, you want some help or you want those ladders. He says, yeah. Yeah, okay, I'll take that. Five years I've been here. I didn't ever say anything to this guy. What's my excuse? The issue of blood is living right next to you. What have they heard? What have you heard? And have they heard about Jesus? Would you stand with me in prayer?